So yes, I am going to talk about pesticides in general and specifically, and uh, I'm going to talk about their impact on uh, human and planetary health. Um, and I'll warn you now, it's all a bit doom and gloom for the vast majority of this presentation. It's not, it's not overly uplifting, um, but I, I suspect you, you maybe thought that might be the case anyway. But there will be some uplifting stuff at the end about what you can do and what we can all do together. Um, so, Pesticide Action Network, uh, that's who we are. That's basically what we do, try and protect people and planet from pesticides. We've been working throughout the globe uh, for 30 years, or maybe 30 years plus actually, initially set up uh, as a workers' rights organisation in Malaysia, trying to protect uh, the health of palm oil plantation workers who were being poisoned and killed by the overuse of pesticides. So we were perhaps one of the, the first to be warning about the dangers and the harm of, of palm oil. Um, so we, we were there and then we, we spread. We, we've got organisations on every continent, um, but we all work completely autonomously on our own separate issues. So we're the only UK charity that focuses on everything to do with pesticides. So whether that's agriculture, use in towns and cities, use in people's gardens, food, workers' rights, land rights, that sort of thing. Anything to do with pesticides, we do it. Over the years, we've helped to get rid of some of the most hazardous pesticides uh, in global use. Uh, we continue to do that. Our, our next big target is paraquat, uh, which is a, an unpleasant herbicide. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit about that later. We've trained, actually that figure's gone up since I did this slide. We've probably trained about 10,000 uh, farmers in West Africa and Ethiopia um, to switch from conventional cotton growing to organic cotton growing. Um, and that has had, I mean, just an amazing Im impact on uh, their health, the health of their families, the health of the environment around them, but also on their income as well. And, and there's lots of good stuff about our cotton work um, on our website, which you can see. Um, and we also help them find markets. And it's, there's not enough organic cotton to supply the, desire, the demand for it, which is great and, and things are really changing because it is one of the biggest users of, of pesticides in the world, the cotton industry. It's a very dirty industry in general. We've worked with Latin American coffee growers to switch away from things like endosulfan. Endosulfan is a particularly nasty pesticide that causes birth defects and has killed people all over the world. We've managed to get a global ban on that. But we've helped with practical solutions about what they can use to replace uh, that. Uh, we spent a lot of time working with some other organisations and some of our colleagues in Africa to get rid of and clean up um, the stockpiles of obsolete pesticides. Uh, literally tons and tons of pesticides dumped on Africa. And these were pesticides that were banned for use in the US or banned for use in Europe because they posed too high a risk to human health and or the environment. And so the pesticide companies, rather than um, dispose of them, showed their truly altruistic side and dumped them in Africa instead, uh, where they leaked into water courses, they poisoned people. So we spent years trying to get rid of them, eradicate those, which has been very successful. Currently we're working in some of the former Soviet republics, like Georgia, um, and that's really about teaching them how to use pesticides safely in the first instance. So things like not storing your food in an empty unwashed pesticide container, not sending your children out into the fields to spray pesticides. I mean, at the moment it's just bringing it up to safe use before we can even start considering reducing and eliminating pesticides. So, that, so that, that's some of the international work we do. I don't work on any of that. Uh, I work on all the UK stuff uh, and sort of EU policy as it affects the UK. Um, and we've got quite a lot going on in the UK at the moment. Um, we've got our Pesticide Free Towns campaign, uh, which I'll, I'll come on and talk about later. We've worked a lot on bees and pesticides and happily almost this time last year we got a ban on the three most bee toxic pesticides, uh, which was fantastic. Brexit is, I'm not going to talk about it today, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's taken up a lot of our time ever, ever since the result of the referendum. You know, there, there are huge threats and, and huge opportunities, and, and I will touch on it a little bit later, but under the sort of the more uplifting section. And, and we've worked on things like glyphosate and trying to get a ban on the use of glyphosate, which is all tied in with our pesticides free towns campaign. So, what are pesticides? There are three 
I think, key things that, that it's worth bearing in mind whenever we talk about pesticides and, and you know, for you to maybe hold in your mind as we go through uh, this evening. So in the first instance, pesticides are poisons. They are designed to kill living organisms. That is their job, that's what they're made for, and they are the only chemical that is released purposely into the environment with the express job of killing something. And they do it really well. We are told that the use of pesticides and pesticides in general are vital if we're going to feed a growing world population. We'll talk about that later as well. And the other thing that they do really, really well, apart from kill things, is make huge profits for the companies that make them. Billions and billions of dollars every single year. That's what pesticides are really, really good at. So who makes them and who controls them? And why is this so alarming? Well, there used to be six, we call them the big six, companies that control all this. But in recent years, there's been a, a consolidation. So we now have four massive companies that control 75% of the global agriculture, ag agrochemical market. So all the pesticides sold are controlled by one of these four, or most of the pesticides sold are controlled by one of these four companies. They also, alarmingly, own, own, actually own, it's theirs, 63% of all the seeds that are sold and used in the world. You know? And a lot of the research, whether that's uh, independent or university-led, is funded by these companies to push and promote their agenda. And what we're seeing happen uh, <sighs> is a takeover of agriculture, actually. They own the seeds, they own the things to grow the plants, they own the research that's driving it. They control everything. That's what they're aiming at. So the whole cycle, and of course this is even without mentioning GM and that sort of issue. Monsanto, one of these, has it renamed itself? It is, sorry, it's that one there. They've just, yeah, they've just been bought out by Bayer. Oh. Bayer are really, really not very happy about it now, given the number of court cases in the US. Um, Bayer is going to end up, uh, Monsanto is going to end up costing them a lot of money. And yes, the reason that Monsanto was so keen to be sold was so they could lose this toxic name that they have. And, and that was the underlying reason for it. The others are just about consolidating power and, 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 and research and this sort of thing. The only one that stands alone is BASF. And, Oh, I don't really like to say it, they're, they're probably the nicest of the lot. In fact, they produce the least toxic things. But the, these others, Syngenta in particular, uh, are, are not very nice, but they're, they're now part of ChemChina. Dow, of course, were the people that were responsible for Bhopal and have shirked their responsibilities to the uh, thousands and thousands of people that have died or been harmed in Bhopal. Uh, again, merging with DuPont helps them step further away from that. And, uh, escape their financial and moral responsibilities to the people that they've killed. And actually, I don't mind this all going out because it's not slander, it's actual fact. So again, what do pesticides do? Kill things, this is the real big thing. So between one and three percent of agricultural workers are poisoned every year as a result of using pesticides. Using pesticides for the food, to grow the food that we eat. A million of them are hospitalised, and there are 300,000 pesticide-related deaths every year, mostly in the developing countries. That's 850 farmers and growers or members of their family die every single day of the year to help us import the food that we eat. I find that a very alarming figure, um, and I, I suspect you all do too. There are also 250,000 suicides annually uh, related to pesticides. As some research has shown, if we ban just one pesticide, the one I mentioned earlier, Paraquat, we could halve the number of suicides annually. Halve it, just by banning access to that one pesticide. It's the poison of choice for farmers in India, farmers in the developing world, uh, mounting debts. I'll take a teaspoon of Paraquat, that's it. It's irreversible, can't do anything about it. So if it wasn't available, it wouldn't be so easy. And many of them do it as a, as many suicide attempts as a cry for help. The trouble is you can't undo what you've done once you've taken Paraquat. So just banning that one pesticide would help reduce uh, the number of deaths every year. I told you it wasn't going to be a barrel of laughs this talk. <laughs> so, 
It's not just humans that uh, pesticides kill. In the UK, we have lost nearly 50% of our farmland bird species uh, since the 1970s. A result of changes in the way we grow food, agricultural intensification and the use of pesticides. Now, you've, many of you may have seen the Dave Coulson talk, so I'm not going to bang on about bees too much because he does it much better than me. But just this one new class of neonicotinoids, uh, which started use in the, in the late 1990s, we were actually one of the first organisations to warn about their impacts and what they would do to bees and pollinator species. And we started seeing these massive declines in the US in 2005. Same thing in 2007 in Europe. Uh, people started to think, well, maybe it's these new pesticides because we haven't seen this before. And it correlated perfectly. I'll talk about correlation a bit later as well. But it correlated perfectly. Massive bee declines, massive increases in the use of neonicotinoids. Um, and you know, it didn't take a lot to put two and two together, but it did take us um, until last year to actually get some action, regulatory action, to get these banned. And this is from Dave Goulson. One gram, uh, a little more than the weight of a sachet of salt would provide, well, it would kill roughly 25 metric tonnes of bees. I've no idea what 25 metric tonnes of bees might look like, but I suspect it's an awful lot of them. Um, so that's, that's what they do. It's not just about the birds and the bees either. We've had an overall 75% uh, decrease in insect abundance in recent years. Who remembers going out driving in the summer? Yeah, windscreen covered with dead bugs everywhere, and it doesn't happen anymore. And it's not because windscreen technology has improved. It's because they aren't there. They've been killed, and they've been killed by pesticides, and our use of insecticides in particular. We've had a 97% decrease in hedgehog numbers since the 50s, and 50% decrease in what was left since 2000. We've lost 95% of our wildflower meadows since the Second World War, and despite best attempts to restore them, we've maybe returned about 0.5% of those. Uh, despite the importance of them as habitats for our biodiversity. So we are decimating our biodiversity everywhere. Bats, toads, frogs, voles, you name it, everything is suffering. And it's a result, and there are multi-factors um, to this. Pesticide use and the way we grow our food are two of the most important factors in these biodiversity losses. And you know, this is part of the sixth maths extinction that we are going through, and it is happening. And it worries me that we may have reached an irreversible tipping point, um, unless we, there is drastic action. So, as them, let's talk a little bit about the impacts on human health, shall we? So, they do. Pesticides aren't targeted at humans. They're targeted at insects, pests, diseases, and whatnot. However, they don't just limit themselves to the things that they're designed to kill or control. If they did that, they probably wouldn't be a problem. But they have impacts on non-target species, so birds, bees, insects, hedgehogs, and people. And the effects of pesticide poisoning can be uh, either acute, which is when you have an instant effect, maybe you've been using them somewhere, or someone's sprayed near you, or you, you live in a house next to a, a field, or you're walking down the street and you get sprayed by somebody trying to get rid of the dandelions. And they can be quite unpleasant, but short-lived. What's more worrying and what's less understood are the chronic effects, the chronic health effects uh, of pesticides. I like this, DDT is good for me, that's how they used to sell them. Yeah, and there was all sorts of, yeah, it's great, safe to drink. So there are numerous routes of exposure for us in our, in our daily life. So you can be sprayed directly, which in fairness doesn't happen very often, but there are pesticides in the atmosphere, uh, there are pesticides in the soil, there is pesticides in the water that we drink, there is pesticides in the food that we eat. Um, and you can brush past it if you've gone next to some in someone's garden perhaps, or uh, for a walk in the countryside next to a treated field or through a treated field. And you can absorb them through your skin, you can breathe them in, uh, obviously you can have oral exposure as well. So there are many, many ways of being exposed and for us to take pesticides on board. Us. Um, Every single one of you here, and every single one of us in Brighton, and every single one of us in the UK and globally has got DDT inside them. All of us. Um, even 
people that were born after it was banned from use because it passes through the mother, it passes into the infant and it carries on and carries on. There are polar bears with DDT in and there's, there's not a lot of farming there. Pesticides are very, very mobile in the environment. They travel, they go to the places they shouldn't go. If you look at neonicotinoids, they were coated on seeds and planted in the ground and grown up into the plant. Even so, 95% of them actually didn't go in the plant and went off elsewhere, whether it was into the uh, wildflowers growing next to the field or into the water or into the soil or into the atmosphere. So pesticides are highly mobile and they don't necessarily degrade as rapidly as people would have you believe. So, there are known harmful effects. This is not just us saying it. Pesticides are regulated around the globe and they're regulated for a very good reason. They are carcinogenic. They are reproductive toxins. They are neurotoxins. They are endocrine disruptors. Now, this is the people that make them that are saying this. You know, that's, that's, there's no secret about it. And the most vulnerable are the unborn infants and children, and to an extent the elderly as well. But these are, the, the, are particularly to endocrine disruptors. These are the real targets, um, non-target victims of pesticides. Uh, this is where the long-term effects can really establish themselves. If we just have a look briefly at glyphosate uh, and the issue of glyphosate, it's the most widely used herbicide in the world. Um, it is used everywhere. It's used on the streets, parks, playgrounds, schools, hospitals, fields, food, you name it, it's everywhere. It's, increased, its use has increased massively um, over the years. It first came out in the 1970s. Roundup's the most commonly known one and probably the most widely known one, but there are lots and lots of products uh, that have glyphosate in them. It's out of patent now, um, so anyone can put together a, a weed killer and use glyphosate in it. It is, of course, intrinsically linked with GM crops. Um, you know, we've got the Roundup Ready varieties so that you can plant your field and go and douse it with glyphosate and it'll kill all the weeds, but now we're seeing resistance to that and they're having to use older things. So the increase in use has, has, has been dramatic over the years. Now these, uh, and it's been linked to cancer uh, recently by the World Health Organization. There's some debate about the degree of that, but you know, the, the science is showing it. The birth, it linked to birth defects a long, long time ago. Um, and these were actually all known you know, people are saying, well, well, they're not, you know, this is all new, it's not. These have been known since the 1970s and 1980s when the studies were done for its first approvals. You know, our regulatory authorities have sat on this information. There's linked to a number of things. These graphs here are taken from um, a study done by somebody called Stephanie Seneff. Now, she's not an epidemiologist, she's not a toxicologist, uh, I think she's a statistician or something, and they are in no way conclusive, you know, it's not some robust science. What she's done though is draw together, I think there are 33 different graphs, I've just shown four here, which shows the increase and in prevalence of, of a whole range of different, um, different ill health problems, diseases, this sort of thing. So we've got bladder cancer, liver cancer here, uh, obesity, um, and I think that's, yeah, that's uh, celiac disease. And she charted them against the increase in the use of glyphosate. And now for all 33 of the things that she looked at, there is a close correlation in the upward trend of the disease or health problem and the upward trend in the use of glyphosate. Now, correlation doesn't um, mean causation. However, with that many things correlating, it should raise some kind of concern, I think, and it's something that needs to be looked at more closely. But it isn't because glyphosate makes an awful lot of money. <laughs> and uh, as a wise man once said, follow the money. So what else do they do? He's wonderful. So endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, many of the pesticides used in agriculture, mainly the fungicides, uh, are linked to endocrine disrupting, disruption, which affects the hormone system. It's particularly harmful to infants and children. And what's interesting with endocrine disrupting chemicals, which I have to say aren't just pesticides, they are all around us. There, there are many, many endocrine disrupting chemicals. What is fascinating and what is being shown more clearly 
as research goes on, is that the dose no longer makes the poison. So you don't have to have a large amount of it to have an effect. In fact, EDCs have turned that on their head, and actually the lower the dose in many cases, the, height, the more heightened the effect. It's baffling and it's, it's hard for people to understand, but it, it, it seems to be the, the, the case. Uh, because it's dealing with these hormone triggers, this sort of thing. Um, and they've been linked to all sorts of diseases because it, it's about development. So it affects children in the early stages of their development, it affects different ways of developing their hormone system, and it can lead to a whole range of different things that are not fully understood. Um, so EDCs, uh, we, we should not be putting them on the food that we eat. We should not be putting them in uh, the fields where we grow our food. Um, and yet many, many pesticides are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Oh. Sorry, it's just easier than, than, than racking that out all the time. Just going back a bit, the, the case in the United States, yeah. is that what, what chemicals are? That was glyphosate. Uh, is that, they're, under the, they're under the hammer now. Oh, they're really, really under the cosh. So the first case was a school groundskeeper who contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, as a result of his, his work. And the case itself didn't actually say that it caused the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What it said was they had not warned that there was a possibility that this might be a result. The second case, which they also lost, uh, were just a couple who used Roundup in their garden over many, many years. And exactly the same thing. They both had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's the one that it's been specifically linked at, and, and tests have shown that it does. So another case underway now, and another 11,000 to follow. Um, uh, he got, the first one got $78 million in compensation. Um, Did he actually get it? He hasn't got it yet, but he will do, because they're obviously appealing and hoping he'll die before they have to pay it out, because that, that's, 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 obvious, yeah. that's how they work. Yeah. Um, but they probably will get it. Uh, and they've already, there was, um, actually just today, a business analyst uh, has looked at Bayer, who have just bought Monsanto, a really bad timing for Bayer. And they're looking at, uh, and not an if, but when, they will be paying out billions and billions in settlements. Um, and they'll probably not want to take them all to court, and they'll, they'll look to settle these cases outside. But yeah, it's, it, it's quite groundbreaking. There are some coming up in Europe as well, uh, and I think we might have a case possibly in the UK at some point. But it's a lot harder to actually take them to court um, in the UK than it is, for example, in the US. But it's, it, it's rattled them. Bayer's shares have plummeted since the first one, and they keep going down. Um, and and it's, it's really ignited the public um, and it's really ignited uh, regulators and politicians, even at a local level. So as soon as the first court case verdict came in, the number of calls that we got from council saying, what can we do? We should maybe just think about switching away from it. Because of course a council here, given that we've had these cases, given that what we know, the council can't afford to start paying compensation to its employees that it's asked to use glyphosate over the year or, or, or residents that have been exposed to it or, or anything. So it, it's a bit of a, a, a game changer. And if they're not doing it because they're worried about the toxicity of it, they're doing it because they're worried about financial liabilities. Personally, I don't care. I don't really care what their, their, their justification for doing it is or their reason for doing it. I'll, I'll, work, I'll work with that. Yeah. Um, it's just one more bit of leverage that we, we've possibly got. Um, so where are we next? Oh, so, so, and, but the problem is, uh, and no, these court cases are, are important, it's almost impossible to link chronic ill health outcomes with exposures to pesticides because we are exposed to so many different chemicals on a daily basis, whether it's where we're walking around, the food we're eating, whatever it happens to be. It's really, really difficult to make that direct connection. The only one that really has is with sheep farmers who were poisoned by organophosphate pesticides as a result of sheep dipping. Now there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in the UK who have been poisoned in that way. They've died, they've had their lives destroyed, and they have had, suffered serious nerve damage, um, and Parkinson's and other related things. And that was very clear. That, we actually knew about that, but they have never been compensated. Now I, I caused a bit of a, a bit of a stir on social media when we had the news that Salisbury had been cleaned up after the Novichuk, you know, poisoning issue. And, and I drew a comparison. Uh, it was about, you know, whether you'd been 
Whether you'd been exposed to organophosphate pesticides, whether you'd had expert medical attention following your exposure, yes or no, whether you'd made a full recovery after your exposure, yes or no, um, and a couple of other things. And if you answered yes, then you were probably in Salisbury, and if you answered no, you were probably a sheep farmer. Because it's the exact same thing that the sheep farmers were poisoned with, as was used in Salisbury. It was a weaponised organophosphate pesticide. And it's not that surprising, because all the pesticides were developed uh, initially as nerve agents for use in the war, the First World War and the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, I thought, oh, we've got all this stuff, we've got all this chemistry, yeah, what, what can we do with it? Well, let's water it down a little bit and we'll use it to kill our pests and insects. So that's where they come from. You know, they, they have a long um, and unpleasant history uh, behind them. They're not nice things. Uh, at all. So, so that was, yeah, that was, that was the thing. So they, the sheep farmers are the only ones that have really been able to say, yes, this was a direct result of that, and yet they, again, are waiting for them to all die so they don't have to pay compensation or admit liability because it would open the floodgates, potentially. Are they still using that stuff? No, I mean, what happened, they, they, they had to treat, treat it for sheep, treat their sheep for sheep scab. Uh, and the reason being... The French and others in Europe wouldn't import sheep with sheep scab for you know, uh, veterinary reasons. So the government made it mandatory for farmers to dip their sheep. They had to do it, whether they wanted to or not. And what the government didn't do, despite knowing the dangers, was provide any kind of uh, information about safety, how to use these things properly. Um, they, in fact, advised them to use rubber aprons, which made the uh, made it worse because the pesticides permeated through the rubber aprons uh, and various other things. So it was, it was down to the government really making it mandatory and then not providing information to farmers on what to do. Is that a question? Or? That seems like it would taint the, the meat too of the sheep if the sheep were being used kind of like the sheep were being used like... Potentially, uh, it, it, it may have. I mean, you do sometimes get pesticide take up in, in meat, but I don't think there was necessarily any uh, looking for residues at the time, uh, so it's quite possible. But well, I'm going to come on to food very shortly. Don't worry about that. Oh yeah, no, we have. We have, you've still got a long way to go down the pesticide rabbit hole. So food. So this is one of the paths of uh, exposure for us. So in the UK. About 60 to 70% of all the non-organic fruit and vegetables that are on sale to the public contain one or more pesticide residues. Now that's quite a lot. These are the fruits. This is just from 2017. These are the, I mean, they don't test them all the time. But the government do test residues. They, they do a um, fairly limited amount of sampling. Um, but it's supposed to be representative of people's diets and or you know, what, where you can get them from. So it comes from supermarkets, it comes from shops and markets and wholesale distributors and ports and, and this sort of thing. It's not just British produce, it's what's on sale, so it can come from, from anywhere. So this column here is probably the one that um, is worth, or is the most concerning, the one, the one that's worth taking most note of. So this is percentage of samples containing multiple pesticide residues, so that's more than one. And it can go up to as many as 14 different pesticides on one bit of fruit, well, uh, in this case. Um, and of course we're eating them all in combinations. Now pesticides never are assessed um, on how they work in combination. They're only ever assessed on their individual effects, whether that's as a residue or whether that's out in the environment. So there is nothing, and, and it's understandable, you know, there are millions and millions of potential food pesticide combinations and testing it would be, hey, really expensive and really time consuming and, and really difficult and they're all safe anyway. <laughs> but uh, but, but um, this cocktail effect, the, the, this combination of pesticides, it, it, it is, it's a huge, like, we don't know. There is research to show that actually when taken in combination, the effects are increased and enhanced and changed in ways that we have no understanding about. Um, so we don't really know what's going on. You know, this is uh, a bit of an experiment on us, it's a bit of an experiment on the environment, so it's not just the effects on us, it's the effects of how 
a fungicide, an insecticide, a herbicide might work out in the environment as well. And of course all the testing of pesticides is done inside a laboratory. So it's not actually done in real world conditions. So we don't know what happens when it interacts with rain or it interacts with a particular type of soil or, or, or any of the other ways that these things can be changed. Um, so the cocktail effect and the low dose effect are the two real issues and they're certainly the real issues when it comes to dietary exposure to pesticides. So that's the fruit. I'll put you off your fruit, uh, and these are the vegetables that I shall put you off as well. Again, this, is the, this changes every year, they, they do different things, and, and not everything's as bad as, as the other thing. But it's these, the, these constant combinations that we are ingesting on a daily basis that, that we have no idea about what they're doing. You know? and as I said, this is non-organic fruit and vegetables. Organic fruit and vegetables almost never have residues present. Almost never. Not never, but almost never. Um, the reason you will find pesticide residues occasionally on organic produce is a result of cross-contamination from non-organic, for the most part, or it's been stored or somebody's lied somewhere down the line. Organic produce does use some limited amount of pesticides. Um, you know, it's not completely pesticide-free. Um, but it does use a limited amount, but it doesn't turn up as residues, uh, and they are very, very controlled about what they do. So that's those pesticides in food. And this is a study we did uh, last year, I think, possibly the year before, looking at the school fruit and veg scheme. Now, the school fruit and veg scheme is a very noble endeavour. And it's, you know, most basic. It was put forward by the Department of Health, run by the NHS, uh, the idea being that we give every four to six-year-old child in England one piece of fruit or vegetable every day. And we give them you know, different ones, and the idea is that, that it will help promote um, healthy eating habits going on into later life, it will at least provide them with a piece of fruit or vegetable if they haven't got it, and it's part of the whole healthy approach. So we thought, well, that's, that's, that's really great, and, and we applaud that, and, and we think people should eat fruit and vegetables regularly, every day, maybe. Um, and we thought we'd have a look at the residues that were found within the fruit and vegetables in this particular scheme. And this is what we found. It's actually worse than the general produce on sale to the public. I mean, one thing that, I mean, not pesticide related, but one thing we found was that all the bananas served the children, not one of them is fair trade. I didn't even know you could get a non-fair trade banana anymore. Um, so yeah, we found Residues of, and often in multiples on, on, the, you know, on the same bits of fruit, we found 62 insecticides, 50 fungicides, 4 herbicides, insect growth regulators, plant growth regulators, microbiocides, and of those, 24 known carcinogens, 2 probable carcinogens and 26 possible carcinogens. 43 suspected endocrine disruptors. So we are feeding residues of endocrine disrupting chemicals to children at their most vulnerable age as part of our healthy diet and living attempt. 21 neurotoxins, 15 developmental or reproductive toxins, and, and that's, that's what we're giving them. So then we had a look at what it would cost to change this to an all organic supply of fruit and veg. We did the, did the sums and we spoke to some organic fruit and veg buyers. It would cost a penny per child per day to make that difference, which is not a lot, and I'm fairly certain most parents wouldn't bulk at a penny a child per day. So we pointed this out, we wrote to the Minister for Health, which at the time was Jeremy Hunt, and uh, he wrote back and said, well, pesticides aren't our issue, that's a farming issue. So the Health Ministry of Health, and we've been trying for years and years and years, are not interested in pesticides. They do not believe pesticides are a health issue, they believe they're an environmental and a farming issue, and therefore it's DEFRA's decision. However, in France, the health ministry meets with the farming ministry and they talk about the effects of pesticides. Pesticide poisoning is an occupational hazard officially recognised in France. They care about their farmers. They care about what they're giving to their children. They've just come out with a, a thing in France that all publicly procured fruit and vegetables uh, will be locally sourced or 50% organic in the next two or three years. They're really interested in it. But that was, I'm going to say I'm shocked. I wasn't really shocked at the, at the poor attitude of the British government on this. 
which brings me on to pesticides in our environment. So this is the town's bit. This is where we're talking about non -ag not agriculture. Uh, we've sort of talked about that, killing the biodiversity. This is more about affecting us. Uh, so every year, hundreds of tonnes of pesticides are used across UK towns. So again, we've got the poisons thing. Most commonly used is glyphosate. It accounts for about 75% of the pesticides used on our streets and cities. 2,4-D uh, is another beauty, better known as Agent Orange. Uh, still available, uh, but with a rebranding. Um, they're both probable human carcinogens, and millions of people are potentially exposed on a daily basis. You know, you, in the UK, there's about a million people live around farms. The bulk of people live in, in, in cities and uh, urban areas, and we risk, by just by going about our daily business, being exposed to pesticides that are used. Pesticide runoff also contaminates water supply, so when it's used on a pavement, it runs off quite quickly, gets into the water, uh, the co water companies will make the effort to take it out of our water, not always successfully, and of course that costs a lot of money and that's then reflected in our water bills. So they're also pushing up our water bills. Um, but the thing is, hundreds of towns and cities are already pesticide free around the world. France, I, I keep going on about France, but they've been really progressive. They bought a, a complete ban on the use of all non-agricultural pesticides. You know? uh, so you as a, well, not you, people as gardeners cannot go into a garden centre and buy a herbicide or an insecticide to spray on their roses or their lawn. They can't spray the streets, schools and pavements anymore. They just said, well, there's no, there's no need. There's no need. We don't need them. We'll, we'll, we'll get on perfectly well without them. So it isn't just glyphosate, though. 75% uh, there is all these other things. 41 different active substances used throughout the immunity sector. And when I talk about the immunity sector, I'm talking also about things like golf courses, sports pitches, bowling greens, uh, railway, railway lines, uh, you know, anywhere that's not agricultural. We've got all these things, and this is the one. So this is the top 15 most frequently used in the immunity sector. Of that top 15, 30 are either 13 are known possible or probable human carcinogens, and a bunch of suspected endocrine disruptors. And again, we're spraying these in places like parks where our children play, where we go to relax. We're spraying them in schools. We're spraying them in hospitals, which I find very strange. You know, it's all to keep weeds down. The main culprit seems to be the dandelion. I don't know, people hate dandelions. I don't know what they're concerned about, but we can't have a dandelion there. It's unsightly, it's ugly. So we have, what are we doing about all this? So in terms of towns, uh, we are a very small organisation. Uh, there were at the time just me doing this, uh, and I couldn't possibly get out to all the towns and cities in the UK, much as I'd like to. I've been to quite a lot of them. Um, but we thought, you know, this is about people, people asking for change, people wanting to do things differently. And, and we thought, well, let's empower people to do that, be that change, become the change, and, and make things happen. So we created a whole range of different materials. We've got guides and leaflets and case studies and posters and petition templates, all of which is free for anybody to use whatsoever. The idea that we can then say, somebody wants to contact us, say, how do I stop using pesticides? Well, start your own campaign. We'll help you. We'll supply all the materials. You can use everything you want. We'll advise you along the way. I'll come and speak if you want. Or I'll come and meet with the council if you want. Anything, you know, that sort of thing. We've currently got about 80 campaigns running around the country. From Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, throughout England. And we're running our own in Brighton, but I'll come back to that. So it's been really successful. It's been a great way of engaging the public. Um, and it's, it's starting to see some real, real changes. So, I mean, this year, this year alone, we've had Bristol adopt a pesticide-free policy, Derry in Northern Ireland, uh, North Lanarkshire, Trafford in Manchester, which we'll hope will, will follow suit, the rest of Manchester will follow suit, we had Croydon, um, stop using it in their parks, um, public green spaces, uh, and many more little ones that, that are doing so. It's really having an effect. And the idea that people are telling their local council that they want things to change, it, it's really powerful. And Brighton? I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'm saving that one. <laughs> that, that comes under the what can you do section. 
loosely speaking. So what else are we doing? Well, we are working higher up. I mean, so with the Pesticide Towns campaign, what we hope one day is to get a national ban on non-agricultural pesticides, as they, have, as they have done in France. So the idea is that we can show that it's possible, we can show that it's what wanted. We can say, well, actually, look, you know, a third of the towns and cities across the UK have already gone pesticide-free, so bring this in. We're also working on, on, on other areas of, of national policy, and this is where the Brexit thing comes in. So Brexit provides both serious threats but also real opportunities. Uh, I'm, depending on what day of the week it is, I either feel very, very cynical or very, very optimistic about where we might be going with all this. So the threat um, is that we deregulate massively. Now, the EU regulatory system on pesticides is the best in the world. It is a long way short of perfect, but it is better than anything else that's out there. It's better than the US, it's better than Canada, it's better than Australia. It's it veers towards precautionary, uh, a precautionary approach, you know, and, and it does. Um, it, it's delivered quite a, a lot of things. And most of those measures have been massively opposed by the UK government of whatever colour rosette they happen to wear. Um, because they are beholden to the National Farmers Union, they are beholden to the pesticide industry, and they lack any kind of clear vision or understanding that their job is to protect the citizens and the environment of the country that they represent. They feel, fail to do that. They prefer to protect big business. <coughs> However, that said, there are some opportunities, which has come in the very unlikely form of Michael Gove, um, who was given the post as DEFRA minister, uh, which is not generally seen as any kind of a promotion or a thank you. In fact, quite the opposite. But he's come out saying, well, I'm not in a farming constituency. I can be the greenest environment minister ever to try and, you know, improve my reputation, maybe try and detoxify some of, the, uh, some of the Conservative Party as well. He's done a good job, but he's been saying some good things. We've got a new agriculture bill in the pipeline. And if we can get some of these things in there, then that would be a real step forward. So the first thing that we're asking for, which has never happened in the UK, other EU countries have got them, is a pesticide use reduction target. Something for us to aim at. Something for all the various parties to, to say, well, actually, we, we're trying to work towards a 50% reduction or whatever it happens to be, whether that's based on getting rid of the ones that pose the greatest threat to human health or the ones that pose the greatest threat to bees and pollinators or the ones that are constantly showing up in our water supply, whatever it happens to be. Just the notion that we can have some kind of target to aim at, some kind of driven policy that would take this forward. I mean, as, as an example, some research done recently, not, not that, a few years ago now, not by us, but by a, a fairly pro-pesticide uh, agricultural research centre, showed that with what we know now, the techniques and methods that we know now, we could overnight reduce the use uh, of all pesticides in the arable sector by 30% without affecting yields, without affecting farmers' incomes. Now, to my mind and to our mind, that if that is possible, that is then what we should be aiming at and supporting. But it has not happened. We would like to see an integrated pest management, which is what IPM stands for, research and extension service. So something that, somewhere that farmers can go to to find advice on how to reduce the use of, their use of pesticides. You know, it, it benefit farmers anyway because they were spending less on pesticides. That would increase their income. It would benefit the environment. It would benefit human health. No, but there is nothing like this. Nothing like this exists. Denmark has got a fantastic extension service. France has developed them. There are other examples, good examples around the world, where farmers can go and, and, and find real-world um, solutions to the, the, to the real problems that they face. Um, and, and it doesn't cost them anything. It's part of it. One of the, the, the things that... You know, and it's going to become necessary because there is talk about restructuring the common agricultural policy once we leave Europe. That farmers, and this, this, is a, this is a good thing, farmers will no longer be paid just because they've got a bunch of land, regardless of what they're doing on it. The idea is that farmers will only be paid money, public money, for delivering public goods. And those public goods are defined as clean water, clean soil, etc., etc., more increased biodiversity. But they're not going to achieve that at the current level of pesticide use. 
So all of these nice, think of the 25 year environment plan, the agriculture bill, all the things that have been set out as goals, more sustainable agriculture, etc., increased biodiversity, none of it will be achievable unless we tackle the use of pesticides and seriously reduce or stop them. And the final one, I mean, we've got quite a lot, we've got about 12 different R's, but these are the sort of the headline ones, is to introduce a pesticide tax. You know, a, a tax on the most toxic pesticides. Um, not only could that money then be used to filter into the IPM Research and Extension Service, which would train farmers to reduce pesticides, but a higher priced, more toxic pesticide will be less attractive for anyone to use. So it's a mechanism for automatically reducing it. And these have been uh, used in various places. Again, it's massively opposed by the National Farmers Union and uh, the pesticide industry um, for fairly transparent reasons, I'm guessing. So that's kind of what we're doing, and that's what we, we continue to do, uh, and we'll continue to aim for these things. And we've got a lot of support. There seems to be a lot of support. There's a lot more interest in pesticides in general. Since the bees started, when I first started doing this, nobody knew about what a pesticide was. Nobody could name a pesticide. Now, I can talk to people, and they know too. There's, there's the one that kills the bees, and there's the one that gives you cancer which is a step forward. So I do thank the bees for the, their, their sacrifice in raising the issue of pesticides, but it has taken off. And we're seeing a change. I, feel, I do feel over the last 10 years there has been a positive change in perception amongst the public and amongst some of our politicians. Not enough, but some. So I, I, I'm feeling quite optimistic today. So what can you do? you can join us in trying to make Brighton and Hope of pesticide free. Now, we nearly won this in 2016. We got a motion put past the council, which was adopted unanimously by all parties, to say they would work to phase out glyphosate and trial alternatives. Um, and they didn't. They, uh, they just let it slide, and there were some changes in personnel and, and this sort of thing. So we want to make it really happen this time. Um, so you've, yeah, you have, because you're from there. You, so Infinity have been supporting us. They've done a great window display. If you haven't seen it yet, it's there until, it might even be there until the election. I think it's there until the 2nd of, 2nd of May. So if you haven't seen it already, go and have a look. It's a really nice section. Thank you, Infinity, for doing that. Um, it's really helped. And here's what you can do, what we're asking. It's for all council candidates, anyone who's standing, from whatever party it happens to be, to pledge that if they're elected, they will take action to stop the use of pesticides throughout Brighton. It's not, they're not signing themselves over to us, you know, the client and sinker. We're asking them to do a few fairly easy tasks, but support it in general. Now, we had a really good result. We did this in London last year for the local elections. We got... Uh, Every single member of two or three councils took our pledge. And we got, I think, three quarters of London councils had people who had taken pledges. We can hold them to it. It's, 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 it's a really quite effective way to do it. Like yeah, that's, well, yeah. <laughs> but they kind of do. Councillors are a little bit more, um, uh, I don't know, switched on to the vagaries of the voting population. It doesn't take a lot of votes to get either elected or unelected in, in, in a council situation. So at the moment we've got about 80 candidates pledged, I think, which is... I think counted 76 earlier. 76, brilliant, okay. Well, that's about 80. Round it up. Well, maybe a few more. There might be, yeah. <laughs> they do come in. They do come. We've definitely had a few today. Um, so what you can do is visit our website uh, and uh, send them an email and ask them to take our pledge. Um, it's... I mean, it's looking good. We had a hustings, environment hustings, on Thursday downstairs. Um, and we had representatives from the four main parties. And they all said, yes, of course we're going to do this. Uh, yes, we'll go pesticide free. But what we're asking for Brighton, and the plan for Brighton really is um, to adopt a policy rather than just a motion. So that they've got a clear policy of, of where they're going. Um, and we've, uh, what Bristol have done is take a three-year plan because it, it is difficult, it is daunting for them to do it overnight, and, and it's understandable there are potential financial things, and it's, it's about you've got to train stuff. So a three-year plan, where in the first year you stop the use in all parks and green spaces. So we've already got the level which hasn't used pesticides at all for six years. 
uh, because Steve from the level decided that that's what he wanted to do. People come and ask him, he said, so how have you done it? He said, well, I haven't done anything. I just don't do anything. <laughs> I haven't switched. I haven't replaced it with anything. I see a weed where it shouldn't be. I'll pick it up on my walk and I'll get other people to do that. And it's that simple. But he's moved off to Crawley now. Um, so, but we've got that example here. And it's, it's, it's one of the easier bits is the parks and green spaces. Also in the first year is, is the idea of setting up a task force. So it's not just the council doing it, but they create a task force to draw in other land managers. So whether that's the universities or Network Rail or whoever owns um, Churchill Square, anywhere, any of the big land managers, come together, sit around the table, talk about how they can all work together, potentially share costs, share problems, look at how they can overcome these things together and deliver a, a truly pesticide-free town or city. Um, so it's not just the council doing it in isolation because, you know, Council do it, and then you have somebody spraying next door. It's not great. So that's what we want. And then the second year, you can do it quicker if you want, but the second year cut out by 50% of kilometres of roads and pavements that are sprayed in the third year. Get rid of the rest of it. Have a cup of tea. Celebrate. Is Stanmer? Is Stanmer Park pesticide free? Not as far as I know. As far as I'm aware, uh, only the level doesn't use anything. So, so in parks, it's mainly hard surfaces, play areas, picnic areas, that sort of thing that they'll use herbicides on to get rid of unsightly weeds or whatever. Again, it's not, <coughs> you know, we're not asking for the moon on a stick here. It's not difficult. It's a great park. Well, get the whole, the whole city of Ghent's been pesticide free for 30 years. But there's a massive park there and uh, they decided to do it. And They've now got, well, they used to have formal beds with tulips and roses and stuff. They've now got these formal beds that are made of what used to be called weeds. Um, and they're just, and they're beautiful. They're native species and, and they've, got, they've got everything there. They've, they've worked with the public to say, look, you've got to expect to see something different. Uh, so the mayor of Paris, when they went pesticide free 15 years ago, he said, look, you're going to see more weeds growing up out of the drains and around trees and, you know, little cracks and crevices. He said, but, you know, so what? Get used to it. It's, it's for your benefit, and they have. So talking to the public is, is really key, and, and we will help Brighton with that messaging, and we'll work with them, and hopefully be part of the, the, the task force once they create it. But you can help make them do that. So the more they hear about it, if, even if they come to your doorstep and say, hey, you're going to vote for me, it's like, well, yeah, I'll vote for you if you, you do this. We'll send them the emails or whatnot. On a more practical level, these are things you can do to try and uh, reduce your own exposure or, or, or to help us. So switch as much as possible to an organic diet if you are concerned about the effects of, of ingesting these multiple pesticides. Not all fruit and vegetable are equally bad. We've got lists of the worst offenders, so you know you could think about switching out some of those. Grapes, stay clear of grapes unless they're organic. They are just toxic minefields. Sorry, apples as well, they're terrible things. Um, but yeah, but think about switching to organic and, and by doing that you're not just reducing your exposure, you're also creating more demand for organic that will have to be met. So you're supporting organic growers, the people that are doing it, that, that need help to, to, to be supported. Speak to your retailers and tell them you want A, more organic. What are you doing about pesticide residues? Are you helping your um, farmers and growers to reduce their pesticide uh, Pesticide use. Some, we, we've worked with retailers over the years and some of them have done some quite good things, taking out some of the most hazardous pesticides, not just from here, but from their global supply chains. Because going back to one of the earlier slides, pesticides aren't just an end user problem. Pesticides impact all along the food chain. So from farm to fork, there are impacts of pesticides and often the people most heavily impacted are the people growing it for us. Contact your MPs and say the same sort of thing. You know, they need to get behind a proper agriculture bill that is going to deliver a sustainable farming and agricultural sector for the future. Not just for our future, but future generations. We're going to have quite a lot coming up once the dust has settled. So, so if you want to keep abreast of everything that we're doing, if you want to get involved in things that, that we're doing, um, then please do check on that. Don't use pesticides in your garden. I probably don't need to tell you this, but just don't do it. If you want to find out some great ways of dealing with pests, 
we've got a very a free guide to gardening without pesticides that you can download from our website and, and use wherever you like. There's also another great book coming out that, that's come out by a guy called John Walker, which is called uh, uh, Chemical Free Weed Control. I know it's, 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 a great, it's an encyclopedia of all the different weed species and how you can deal with them without using chemicals. It really is fantastic. And, oh? No, he's always digging dandelions out. <sighs> Love your dandelions. Oh, I do. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> We do, we do this every, every spring, okay? So, so it ties in with the pesticide-free town stuff, but dandelion, and it ties in with the bees, and it sort of brings it all together. So when bees emerge from hibernation after a long, hard winter, they are starving. And dandelions are one of the things that can provide them with the, the food that they need to make sure that they can establish strong colonies going on into the year and they're free and they're, potent, they're, they're everywhere. And actually we're seeing some success with it. There's, again, budgetary constraints mean that councils are mowing less, so we're seeing more verges covered in dandelions. But people everywhere are, are seem to have been embracing the idea that we should love our dandelions. I think they're a signal, they're a really nice signal. I mean, cut them down in, at the end of May, once the, once the bees are fed and, and they're happy. So, so these are all little things, all little actions that you can, you can take in your daily life. And, don't ever forget that actually you have a lot of power uh, at your fingertips. You, you, you can, the public can be a very powerful voice. The reason we got those three bee toxic neonicotinoids banned from use across Europe, and bear in mind these are the three best selling insecticides in the world that generate billions and billions of profit for the people that make them. The reason we got them banned was because the public got behind the campaign and millions and millions of people signed their name to position, petitions, contacted their MPs, contacted their representatives where, in whichever country they were in. And it was an example of the power of people doing it. The ban on glyphosate that nearly happened again was a result of the public saying enough is enough. So change can happen and, and you can be the agents of change as well. But you need to make sure that your voice is heard and it can be heard and there are lots of ways to do it. And I'm going to finish with something that we were talking about earlier. So none of this, as you rightly pointed out, Peter, none of this is new. You know, none of this information about pesticides and the harm it does to people or the, or the environment is new. Though 1962 saw the publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And it's the book that helped kickstart the environmental movement. And it was groundbreaking in what it did. It basically said all the things I've just said you know, over 50 years ago. Um, and she was hounded by the chemical industry. She was ridiculed and run down um, for saying what she was saying. But she did get some change. But it ha has not really, the situation hasn't changed. We've just gone on and on. So I'm going to leave you with this. It's my favorite quote from Silent Spring. And it's ironic to think that man might determine his own future by something so seemingly trivial as the choice of an insect spray. And I fear that is a possibility unless we start acting now. I know there's a lot of urgency. We've got the climate proto, the climate strikes, we've got Extinction Rebellion, and they are all telling the urgency, and it is urgent. We need, we need to act before we break things permanently and forever. And that's, uh, that's pesticides. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you.